Using deep learning, we can now solve many challenging medical image analysis tasks as good as human observers can. And here is just one example of that that was done in my group. So what you see here are intracranial calcifications. They are an important risk factor for stroke. So we wanted to segment and quantify them. And this is difficult because their intensity is uh, identical to the bone that they are sometimes uh, almost touching and they can be quite complex in shape and, and they're quite small. Uh, this is just one example of uh, a segmentation task that we could not solve before deep learning and now we can solve it really quite well. We have a very good agreement with manual annotations. And on average, we, we did a visual comparison where an expert had to say which annotations they preferred, the manual or the automated ones. And they had a slight preference for the automated ones on average. And of course, this is just one example. We have seen in the past few years, many examples in which deep learning performs as good as or even better than human observers. However, it requires a lot of representative and annotated data. So as a rule of thumb, uh, Goodfellow and co-authors in their famous deep learning book, they state that um, a rough rule is that you need 5,000 labels, uh, labeled examples at least to get reasonable performance and 10 million to surpass uh, human performance. Well, I don't feel fully agree with that. Within medical imaging, we've seen uh, very good results with much fewer uh, labeled images. Uh, but, but it is the case that typically models performs better, perform better uh, if, you, if you have more data. And, and this is a problem before, because high quality annotated medical imaging data is very difficult and expensive to obtain. So a lot of the research in my group and in other groups around the world focuses on how can we learn reliable models with less data or less annotations. And I want you to show you some examples of our work in that area. So one possible solution is to learn train models from so-called weak labels. Uh, weak labels in this context are any type of labels that contain less information than the label you want to predict. Typically, weak labels are much easier to obtain. For instance, uh, if consider the task of quantifying white matter hyperintensities in brain MRI, and then a typical strong label would look like this, where a radiologist indicates for every voxel in the image, does it belong to a white matter hyperintensity or not? Whereas weak labels uh, could say something like there's a moderate lesion load in this image, or there are white matter hyperintensities present, or uh, just a number of lesions that you see in a certain slice. Another example that I'll also cover in my talk today is uh, quantifying of quantification of lung disease. And then strong labels would typically indicate the abnormalities that are present, what type of abnormalities are there, and uh, and how large are they, where are they? Whereas weak labels would just state that in this image there is emphysema present or there is a typical radiology report statement, upper lobe predominant mixed type emphysema, or, or maybe even what is the lung function in this patient. Now, if this works, we can learn from data that are um, labels that are much more easy and quick and cheap to obtain. For instance, uh, there's a lot of data already available in clinical studies, which has uh, semi-quantitative analysis performed by experts. Uh, we can learn from radiology reports, which are made from many thousands of images on a daily basis, or from clinical databases with patient outcome. And an example that I want to show in that direction is learning imaging biomarkers of COPD. First, a bit of background on COPD. COPD is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. Its early stages are severely underdiagnosed. There is no cure, but a proper disease management can slow progress. So early uh, diagnosis is important. 
The mechanisms that are involved are not well understood. So why do some uh, people get the disease and others don't? We know that smoking is a factor, but also we know that non-smokers can get it, while some smokers can smoke until they're 100 without much issues. There appears to be different phenotypes that progress faster or slower, and we don't really know what discriminates them. And they may require different treatment. So we want to better under, understand the underlying causes, detect subtypes, recognize abnormalities earlier, measure the effect of therapy, and uh, predict progression. And for all that, we need quantitative analysis. Well, quantitative analysis of COPD. Uh, currently, the gold standard for that is lung function tests. So the patient blows in a tube, and you measure how much, much air comes out in the first second. This is not very sensitive, um, and we can't discriminate between uh, different uh, subtypes of the disease, whether it's emphysema or airway really related, and definitely not between different subtypes of emphysema. But to do that and to have a more sensitive uh, detection, we need imaging, and typically that is CT. Now, CT quantification of imaging is based typically on CT density values. We just look at the, at the histogram of CT values inside the lung, ground field values inside the lung, and we measure the relative area of uh, low density below a certain threshold. Well, this uh, gives us some estimate of emphysema. But uh, there, there's a lot of things we can't uh, measure with this yet. So uh, emphysema, we know it has various different subtypes uh, that should have different patterns in CT, and we can't distinguish them with simple densitometry. So here you see an example of three very different CT patterns of emphysema, which would all have identical densitometry values. So we want to do better than that. Now, if we want to, want to quantify patterns and severity of emphysema, this is typically done using uh, visual scoring, which is type, quite time consuming and it's also, uh, it, it can be quite subjective. Here you see an example of an often used visual scoring system. And in that, uh, users indicate the percentage of affected lung tissue. So they eyeball what is in this region what is the percentage of affected tissue? And that indicates the severity grade in a score between one and six, I think. But this is, of course, much weaker information than we would get from manual annotations of emphysema regions, but it still provides very relevant information for the disease. So how can we learn from these annotations? Well, what we did is we trained a network to reproduce these visual scores but then via an intermediate segmentation. And uh, in our uh, network, in our optimization, we make sure that this intermediate segmentation has the right proportion of affected lung tissue. So you see that here, we have pretty much a regular uh, standard regression uh, network that regresses to the visual score, but there's this hidden segmentation layer that uh, needs to highlight a certain percentage of the, of the lung field. So this method, uh, it predicts visual scores, but it also gives a segmentation as well. And it, the model performs very, very well. If you look at how well it predicts visual scores, it performs very well very similar to trained observers, as you can see here in the ROC curves. And I must say that uh, for some cases, whether it's um, grade two or grade three emphysema, that's something like, is this uh, region for uh, 10 to 20 or 20 to 30 percent uh, affected? Uh, humans are just not very good at, at eyeballing that, and also our model trained on, on the human visual scores is, is similar to the human, but not much better. So the main advantage, perhaps, of this technique is that it provides a segmentation. So just training on visual scores, we can also localize the disease. 
But we found that it also performs better than a regular regression network, which is optimized to predict a correct visual score, but without knowing that this label corresponds to a certain proportion of a, of a volume. And the difference between the methods, so what you see here is um, in the left, on the left, a regular regression network, and on the right, the one taking the, the proportions into account. The difference is especially pronounced if you have just small training sets. So this really provides this knowledge of what does the label really mean. It means uh, a certain proportion of the image should be affected. That helps us uh, regularize the, the problem and help, gives better results. <clears throat> now we wonder, do, do we really need expert annotations? Emphysema scoring is notoriously difficult, uh, also between trained radiologists. There is a huge disagreement, especially this eyeballing of the amount of tissue that is affected. It's something that humans are just not very good at. What might be easier for humans to do is to assess which two images, so from these three, is image B or C more similar to A? Which are the, the more similar images uh, of the three? And uh, if, if we can learn useful representations from that, that, but that would mean that we could probably, uh, we could perhaps uh, have this task done by non-experts. So we also tried whether we could do this by, by crowdsourcing. And we found that, uh, so we still need to assess how, uh, how well this really worked. Is it, is it good enough compared to expert annotations? But here you see areas under ROC curves for different lung regions. Once we've uh, we, uh, trained a network uh, on these similarity triplets to find a representation of what, uh, what are similar, uh, what are relevant similar lung patterns. And then uh, we train a simple classifier, simple log logistic regression on this, on this representation on just a small number of training samples. And we see that we get quite good classifications for different regions. And at least <clears throat> it is much better than uh, if you would initialize the model randomly. It's not as good as experts, but it's a, it's a promising result. Another uh, area that I wanted to show you today is uh, learning imaging biomarkers of neurodegenerative disease. And the main example that I want to show there is uh, the quantification of very specific type of brain lesion and large perivascular spaces. Uh, which are an emerging biomarker of, uh, of dementia and, and stroke and possibly other neurodegenerative diseases. So you here see uh, what these perivascular spaces, these PVS, look like. You see T2 images of the brain in, in different locations, different patients. And on the left, you see images without lesions, and on the right, you see images with many lesions. And I've indicated a couple of them with these blue arrows that currently on my screen are not very easy to see. So I, I hope uh, you can see them to some extent. There are uh, quite a few indicated, for instance, here and here. So these are uh, very small, hyper intense in the T2 uh, elongated structures, and we want to quantify them. Well, uh, our typical approach perform a fully manual uh, segmentation and then train a network to, to do those segmentations and base our quantification on that. That is, uh, we couldn't do it. Um, these manual annotations, it's just too time consuming. It can be more than an hour per slice if there's a large lesion load. So typically what is done in Clinical studies is a visual scoring in which you look at different regions in the brain and then just count the number of lesions that is uh, present in a specific uh, slice. And then, of course, we could train a 3D convolutional neural network regression to predict this number. 
Well, what we did was uh, slightly different. We do use a regression network. We have some downsampling in that uh, so that we can afford to have a deeper, more complex network uh, in 3D and it still fits on the GPU. But then we upsample again to the original resolution, similar to what we did in the emphysema example, um, so that we get a, a high resolution attention map. And then this model, so there the key thing is a, a global pooling here. So we train the model with global pooling to predict the number of uh, perivascular spaces that is visible in a certain slice. And then if we leave out the glo this global pooling, then we get uh, an attention map indicating where, what is the location, where, where are the deletions that we, that we counted. And this model had very good agreement with the expert scores. Um, so it's similar to the inter-observer agreement. It is trained on really a large number of scans, I must say. We use here always uh, data from the Rotterdam scan study, which have, has a thousand participants followed over a long time with regular MRI scans taken. So this was trained on, on 1,600 scans. We also tried with, uh, we, we looked at learning curves, and we can see that performance is still quite good if we train on just 400 scans, but it is a little bit lower. So it, it still does help to, to uh, use more scans here. <clears throat> but on the other hand, the labels that we are using, they are easy to obtain. And it's something that uh, in our, well, well, our collaborations, they, they already have this typically. They are doing this on a regular basis for their, for their clinical studies. So there's very good agreement with expert scores. Uh, the model was also more reproducible than experts when you apply it to new images from the same patient taken a few months later. And uh, the associations with typical risk factors are very similar compared to visual scoring. But now what has the network really learned? So far, it, it looks really good. But the only thing we know is that we have learned something that correlates very well with visual scoring. But it could also be something else. It could be, it could be age, it could be other type of lesions, uh, could be brain size, uh, atrophy. So we wanted to look further into what, what has the model learned. Well, the first thing to look at is the attention maps. You see here the attention maps that come out of our specific regression model with the upscaling. Um, and you see also the original images with what a user had annotated as being enlarged perivascular spaces. And you see that uh, by and large, the network focuses on the right lesions. It found evidence for perivascular spaces uh, in the locations that were also annotated by the observer. And in some cases, for instance, uh, most notably this one here in the top left, you see that we have a lot more annotations than the user had. But actually, in this case, those are also perivascular spaces. They are just a little bit less enlarged, and that's why they were not annotated by the user. So the network seems to focus on the lesions. I didn't show that, but it also, um, even though it was trained to predict lesions, the number of lesions in a single slice, it also detects them in other slices. Uh, with similar accuracy. And then we also looked at uh, the overlap, the possible overlap with other lesions that are correlated with perivascular spaces. And we see that there's actually very little overlap between uh, the perivascular spaces and other le lesions that may look similar. For instance, uh, white matter hyperintensities and lacunes. So, even with this very simple label, just the number of lesions in a single slice in a, sing in a specific structure, we have also, the model seems to have learned uh, what specific lesions it needs to, to look at, uh, given that you give it enough data, of course, it can discriminate between these types of lesions. 
So we think this could replace visual assessment in, in large studies and has the potential to Im even improve upon visual assessment by, by using the full three dimensional information and uh, different slices and actually not just counting lesions, but also quantifying their volume and shape based on the, uh, the activation maps. So, so far we've seen examples of cases where labels are weak in the sense that they give less information than dense voxel-wise annotations. But what if labels are just bad? Well, many people say garbage in is garbage out. If your training data is not accurate, you will never get a good model. Um, th there is some truth in that, but it, uh, I, I don't fully agree. And I think this image beautifully illustrates that if you treat garbage in the right way, you can still get a very nice end result. So here you will see an example of bad training data. The task here was to segment the lungs in MRI images. And we had many annotations that were made previously to just to measure the lung volume. So they did not need to be very accurate. And you see that there, is, uh, there, there are a lot of strange, strange structures here that uh, are protruding from the lung. They are in the segmentation counted as lung tissue, but they're clearly not, they shouldn't be part of the lung shape here as well. And there are some holes as well. So these are not very good and very realistic segmentations. Now, if we train our model on images like this and then uh, apply the trained model, so this was trained in a leave on out manner, uh, trained on similar data to the, the image on the left, we do get the result on the right. And in this case, the result is much better than the training data, actually. It's much smoother, has more plausible shapes. So if the training data, if the training labels are noisy, but they don't have a consistent bias, the result of training on that data can be better. So training data does not have to be perfect. Here's another example of something that we did quite some time ago and uh, pre-deep learning. So the task here was to uh, segment the airways in CT images. And uh, well, automated segmentation of the airways, it's actually quite easy for just a few first generations of airways. So that was at that time typically done by just intensity-based region growing. But if you wanted to grow further in the smaller, more peripheral airways, uh, it would become it, it would become problematic, and very quickly uh, all the methods that that we developed uh, that were developed previously they they broke down. So what we did is we took those uh, region growing based annotations and we trained on them. So the the training data is really not very good and very complete. Um, but once we apply this model to new data we can actually get a much more complete airway segmentations. And we can do that because um, even though our training data was, training labels were not very complete, we did find some examples of smaller branches in, in different training images in different regions of the image. And that, so we had seen some examples and that helped us generalize and find those uh, similar branches also in new data. And then if we add additional information, uh, in this case, the, not, the prior knowledge that uh, airways run parallel to arteries, then you can get even a much more complete result. Oh. The last example that I want to show is of a, a special type of inaccurate label which is the labels that you get on unseen data from a model that is, that is not yet fully converged or that is trained on a very small data set. Uh, and that can be used, for instance, in unsupervised learning. It has been used by uh, just adding those surrogate labels uh, to, the new, to the training data and train a new model. But that uh, has the, the disadvantage that you assume that your new labels are largely correct. Another probably safer way to use this kind of information is to ensure only label consistency. 
So we don't really assume that our interme intermediate segmentations are correct. They may be wrong, but the model should output the same segmentation consistently under different transformations. So that, that is what we are optimizing uh, here in this, in this model. So we have uh, nonlinear deformations, two types of nonlinear deformations, and uh, the model is optimized to find similar segmentations in both cases. And here you see the results of that applied to chest X-ray segmentation, um, where you see the segmentation overlap and from left to right, increasing sizes of the training set. The first row is the regular cross entropy segmentation loss and the second row is with label consistency. And you see that this label consistency, it, it helps a, a little, especially in the cases of very small training sets, which, which you see here. But then if we add also unlabeled data, so in the semi-supervised setting, then we see a very large improvement by using the consistency loss. Especially again, when the training set is small. So to conclude, there are many possible ways of reducing annotation workload. Uh, I've shown mostly uh, learning from weak labels, but also some approaches that learn better models from small data sets. In some cases, direct prediction of weak labels may actually be better than first estimating the strong label as an intermediate step, because in many cases, the weak label, which could be uh, the overall lesion load or lesion volume, is actually the main quantity that you're interested in. Annotations don't need to be perfect. Many weak labels are likely better than a few strong ones, and many noisy labels are likely better than a few perfect ones. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>